Ping Sun, I'm from uh, Citizen Science Adult Asia. So we're very happy today we have uh, Dr. Ashia from yeah. Media. So to have uh, some sharing about Citizen Science. Mm -hmm. Okay, welcome. So uh, first of all, would you like to tell us a bit about uh, yourself? So what did you study? Uh, what did you do before this project? Okay. So um, I did my PhD in coffee, which mm -hmm. is okay. super weird because super there's weird. probably like maybe three of us in the world who, <laughs> who spend so much time studying coffee. Um, but uh, I'm basically a human geographer. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, before I was doing this, m most of my work was sort of looking at the rights of indigenous communities, mm -hmm. how um, coexistence between um, you know, wildlife and biodiversity and indigenous communities can be enabled. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it is during my PhD perhaps that I, a lot of my work was in the Western Ghats of India, um, which is of course one of the world's biodiversity hotspots, oh, okay. but is also where you have a lot of coffee plantation. Okay. And so everywhere in the world you actually have coffee. You also do also have a lot of biodiversity. Um, and very many smallholder coffee producers. Yeah. Um, so, you know, coffee is a crop where 70% of coffee is actually grown by people who cultivate on very small it's parcels small of land. So there's livelihood issues that kind of overlap with biodiversity issues mm -hmm. that overlap with market issues as well, um, which makes it quite a fascinating sort of space to work in. So when you're going to do this uh, project study, it could be it must be very difficult because you have to visit every every uh, farmer mm -hmm. for, for the for coffee. Mm -hmm. So, which is yes, I mean we now work, you know, right at the moment we work with about four hundred four hundred smallholder producers. Uh, in the next year, I think we'll probably work with about two hundred or three hundred more, more producers, and it's because the need uh, is there. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, smallholder producers actually totally disconnected from what might be a fair, transparent fair transfer, market trading. and yet um, they follow a lot of farming practices that need to be strengthened mm. that uh, they have in, in such a way that they have really tangible benefits or incentives to conserve biodiversity on their farm. So the need is there. So we have to grow in a sense, um, which makes uh, any kind of top-down approach that's coming completely from Black Bazaar Coffee quite ineffective and quite inefficient. Um, and so we approached um, citizen science or participatory science really from that perspective as well, mm -hmm. which is to say if we can cultivate a sense of community ownership towards how, you know, uh, biodiversity can be conserved, but also how ecological monitoring can happen on coffee farms, then we're in a far better place um, mm -hmm. where, you know, we as a coffee company don't have to go around policing people, mm -hmm. but really um, it's in their interest to monitor biodiversity mm -hmm. and also share that information amongst themselves, right? Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's the approach that we, that we want to use um, going forward. So, uh, do you have any, so far, uh, is there an interesting observation or outcome that you have found after, after uh, investigating? We started for? working. Um, you know, so it's interesting because I think nature creeps back quite fast, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, one of the first things that we did when we started working, which was about three years ago, mm -hmm. was to look at how we can restore some of the native vegetation. Um, and that includes a number of things. It includes some planting of native tree species, but it also includes having restrictions on the removal of native trees. And it includes having restrictions on the kind of regulation of shade. So for coffee, mm. actually the branches of native trees are lopped quite heavily. So you end up with a tree that's just a trunk with a little bit of like, you know, canopy on the top. Uh -huh. Which for birds, for various insects, for a lot of different biodiversity, it has pretty significant impact. So we looked at how to restore the ecological mm -hmm. complexity of farms. And that included, you know, people saying, okay, we won't, we'll shade regulate our native trees once every three years mm -hmm. instead of twice every year. Um, so these small changes actually have led to significant impact. Um, and we've started seeing 
um, certain species that you wouldn't see in human disturbed areas. Mm. So we see mouse deer pretty often, um, which you wouldn't see in human disturbed areas. Mm -hmm. um, we find that soil biodiversity is really quite healthy um, on farms that have, of course, no use of any kind of chemicals, mm -hmm. but also so much native shade cover that all the leaf litter exists on the ground. And you have really interesting um, spider diversity, uh, ant diversity and so on. So yeah, we do start seeing things. But you know, biodiversity takes time yes, and, and restoration too. takes oh, time. Sorry. So so that's the challenge, right? How do you communicate or show people the value of conserving biodiversity when it really takes 10 years to start mm. seeing uh, changes so, and start seeing impacts. Uh -huh. Does the farmer also have here about, so you are a scientist, so that's why you love uh, to see the, the restore restoration of the biodiversity, but how are yeah. those farmers? Do they love to see these kind of changes? As she said, mentioned, because it takes time. It takes so time. Uh, how do they, what's their attitude towards this? Uh, how do they feel? I mean, these Yeah, these so I think coffee is complicated because actually if you grow coffee in a very mm -hmm. intensive way, mm. um, your production is the highest. Yes, yes, so yes. there's always an in incentive to yes. intensify incentive, production, incentive. right? And we're trying to make the kind of economic case for mm. why conserving biodiversity on a farm or why farming in a way that supports biodiversity might actually also benefit yeah, coffee, uh, which is yeah. not very easy to see. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it exists, so we know that you know pollination adds at least 20% to coffee fruit set. Mm. So ha by having, just by virtue of having pollinators, whether it's bees or wasps or a whole range of moths and butterflies, you're actually adding production, yeah, yeah. but but it's difficult to measure mm. and it's difficult for people to make connections with. And believe it. Um, yeah. Except, of course, when you work with indigenous communities who've been living in the forest for thousands of years, mm -hmm. these kinds of intangible connections are easier. Mm. So we don't need to convince them because they've been they seeing it. it. Yeah. They, they know all that. They know it's experienced in mm -hmm. a sense. It's experienced knowledge. Um, but with newer coffee production areas and with people, you know, slightly more younger coffee plantations, um, that's the more challenging case. Mm. So, yeah, so we're, we're in a bit of a, a changing time too. We're, we're beginning to see things, but we're still a little bit young. It's only been three years in a sense. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, if you, so, so far I've, I've heard that uh, you mentioned about you're going to uh, include a lot of uh, small farmers in mm -hmm. the coming years. So, um, let's say if there is a group of uh, potential uh, citizen scientists in front of you, what do you right. want to say to them, trying to in include them into your project? Right. right. So for us, the citizen scientists are actually the producers that we work with. Oh, okay. And so what we're trying to do is say, okay, look, let's say your coffee farm is 25 kilometers away from mine. Mm -hmm. um, but as a group, we all sort of want to know uh, whether it's coffee fruit ripening. Am I, or, or let's say, yeah, this is a better example. Coffee, coffee flowers are blossoming. Yeah. I want to know about bee activity on a farm, right? Mm. Is the, is the, is the abundance working, of bees yeah, different? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and, and coffee flowering is only just a three, four day period. So we need to collect this data really yeah, quickly, short, really short fast. Yeah. And so if I'm actually, um, you know, I'm a part of my hamlet going around to 50 other producers in my hamlet. Mm -hmm. And we're all just making observations about bee activity on our mm -hmm. farms for these three, four days. We can come together share this data, try and analyze it as producer communities, right? So what's happening in our landscape? Because it affects coffee for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, bees are good indicators of biodiversity and, and overall ecosystem health as well. So we can, I think, put these two, three things together in a sense that, you know, ecological monitoring doesn't have to be something that's done by scientists yeah, from the outside. Yeah. But it's actually relevant to me if I'm collecting the data and I'm sharing it and analyzing mm -hmm. it with you and you're my neighbor. It it kind of brings it home in a sense and, and makes it much more relevant in that in that case. So how about the, the last question? Mm -hmm. Okay. So so far, I mean, uh, what do you think? Which is the the, the biggest challenges in this uh, project? Would it come mm -hmm. from government or come from society or come from the mindset or? All of it. All of them, okay. So is it, <laughs> you know, yeah, uh -huh. I think, yes, I think all of it. All of it. 
Um, so the government does not, I mean, do not pay attention on this, or they they mm. they are working, but so far you cannot see any outcome. Mm. Mm, I would say that you know, conserving biodiversity mm. in a way that's more participatory, in a way that's community owned requires effort, Yes. Um, whereas um, having someone come buy your coffee and not ask you any questions yeah. about how you grow it is the easy option, mm. right? So I think there's an effort barrier when you want to facilitate or enable community-based conservation that's, um, that's really robust, that's resilient, that'll last for 10 years. So no, you mean not um, only the farmer, but also the consumer, they maybe have to change their behavior. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's really difficult to get consumers yeah. to care about yeah, yeah, where their they products the are coming from, yeah, right? Or, you know, am I going to look cool drinking this, yes. right? So, so, so the, there, there are challenges mm -hmm. uh, of changing mindsets on both ends of the spectrum, producers as well, and, and, and then consumers as well. Yes. So I think uh, that's it for today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck.